four, three. The uh, the summer stock you did at sixteen was it? You did the death takes a holiday and personal appearance. Do you remember that or where that was? Yes, I do remember. That was in Bowen Island, and Juan Root was the man who actually originated that company, and was the manager. That was sort of the English version of the the actor manager. <laughs> He produced it, he raised the money, he directed it, and he starred in all the shows. <laughs> but that was a great company because it was made up of uh, CBC people. Oh, Sam Payne and, and Dorothy Davies and, you know, those kind of regular people who were doing all that radio at that time. Why Bowen Island? I mean, why? <laughs> well, that's a very good question. <laughs> Why Bowen Island? Why Bowen Island today? <laughs> I mean, not for a living, but I mean for a theater. No, I have no idea why I chose that. I really don't. And Larry McCants, who uh, finally became the uh, head of Canadian Equity, he was the uh, stage manager. And he built all the sets and painted them. He tried to lure the apprentices into, <laughs> into painting with him, but they, those apprentices all arrived from the United States and they fled after the first day. <laughs> We're not having any of this. <laughs> Why was that? Why was it just well, because it was so much work. And I think they got the picture very clearly in the first day that there weren't going to be any of those fabulous roles that they had dreamt of. They were all gone. <laughs> and if you were a maid or something, you know, that would be about it. And the rest was really props, <laughs> paint the scenery, go bring the food, you know, runners, gophers, that kind of thing. So they were gone. And how did the audiences react? I mean, was it... Well, the audiences were very good. I was so surprised that there was an audience. <laughs> but <laughs> there was an audience. And our audience was basically, uh, actually on Bowen Island, was made up of uh, American tourists who stayed at the then, uh, I guess, the Bowen Island Lodge, it may have been called. But it was a very beautiful hotel in a lodge kind of way. <laughs> and uh, they, they went to every play. And uh, some of the local people did too. And then we played... Uh, Gibsons and you know all those kind of wonderful places. <laughs> Actually, Gibsons is where they had the Everyman Theater uh, for a while. I yes, I right. Was that, was that the same time or was that? No, that no, was no. That was another period. Yeah, but we did have a lot of fun experiences, like uh, uh, with because it was all by boat from Gibsons to Bowen and from Horseshoe Bay and so on. And one day we lost the rudder. <laughs> this marvelous little, little water ferry we were on with with the scenery. Scenery stacked on top, actors, but also some tourists, you know, going back and forth. And, and we're drifting out to sea, and we're heading towards a liner, like, you know, one of those cruise ships. And this American tourist asked me, she said, if we capsize or anything goes wrong, will you save my two children? I said, you have to be kidding. I won't be saving myself, so don't talk to me. We had all those kind of fun things. Um, you mentioned CBC Radio as sort of the core group of, of, Bowen, of the Bowen Island company, and, and probably at that time a lot of the local theater originally. Can you tell me a little bit what was happening at CBC at that time? Well, at that time, um, there was a lot of radio drama, you know, originating here. And then uh, in the summer season, the major, because Andrew Allen, the, the biggest man in Canadian radio ever, along with Essa Young, uh, Andrew came from here and had a really created radio drama out of Vancouver. And then later on, as he became very successful in Vancouver, they took him to Toronto and he produced all those great stage series and, you know, huge mammoth productions. And I, I remember when I went to Toronto to do those things, and there were like 90-minute scripts and there were no commercials, no interruption whatsoever. Just, and the script is, you know, you know, break your arms to hold the script. It was like, <laughs> it was like a telephone director for New York. You know, at least Manhattan. <laughs> it, it was heavy stuff. And then they had huge orchestras like uh, Lucio Agostini would do an original score, and the music was live. And you'd be doing this drama thing, and the orchestra would come in the last day of rehearsals, and when that orchestra <laughs> first struck up, you thought, oh, is this a musical? <laughs> What's happening here? I thought this was Oedipus. <laughs> now it's set to music. But he was a great, great arranger and did, you know, good scores for that. So in Vancouver during the summer, Andrew and S and the different people would come out and produce more drama here in Vancouver. And so people were very, very busy. And uh, most of the theater 
that really happened in Vancouver uh, ended up being the core of most theater companies would end up being the regular performers on the CBC. And then there were people like the Buckinghams, Doris and Bill Buckingham, and Jimmy Johnston and his wife Kathy. Uh, they were regulars on shows like the Farm Broadcast. And we used to, other people, we guessed on those kind of things. And they were marvelous shows with inane, ridiculous, <laughs> folksy kind of scripts. And they always ended with a laugh <laughs> and up be kind of music. And then there were other shows like uh, a very famous actor named Evie Young, who actually was the man who uh, launched Theatre on the Stars. I think it was Shakespeare first, you know, on the grass. There was no, there were no seats or anything like that. But he had a show uh, called Eventide, which was like a religious kind of show. And that went on forever and forever and ever. But he played in a lot of, lot of theatre. And then there were local radio personalities too, who worked at other radio stations, like not the CBC, but were radio, you know, personalities, like they had their own talk shows. There was Hilda Brown and, and uh, oh, a man named Alan Routon, who had a kind of a British Empire kind of show. And then there was Frank Vivian and his sister Ruby, and Frank Vivian would act on the CBC. He'd do all the sound effects <laughs> while he played the roles, <laughs> which was just extraordinary. And then he'd write scripts. So many of these people created a niche for themselves at the CBC that encompassed writing, acting, and then if there was a series, like sometimes they do specific series and so on. As I remember one time, Dorothy Davies did a series of adaptations for, for a radio of uh, you know, different Shakespearean plays, and I, I did a lot of those for her. And, uh, Oh, and then adaptations, they did a lot of adaptations, like uh, John Bethune was one of the, you know, finest writers in Canada as far as adapting, you know, classics like Madame Bovary. Oh, I can't, you know, I can't recall them, but they were just amazing. So uh, the acting community here really, uh, if you did something in the theatre, even when there was no professional theater, like there were, there were little bump, little starts, false starts of professional theater, and then it would sort of peter out, and all that would be left would be the Vancouver Little Theater, which had a very high standard though, and the CBC people, they'd end up there, and incredible productions, but because it was a showcase for their work, it was, it was, you know, it was like going to class, or, you know, your actor studios, that's how you, you got to, you know, ply your talents, and and get up on the stage and be in front of people. So they would do little theater and didn't bat an eye. Where was the uh, uh, facilities at that time for CBC? In the Hotel Vancouver. <laughs> actors still, older actors today, they're called by the CBC for anything. I think they still go there. They don't know any better. They just go to the Hotel Vancouver. Yeah, it used to be, and then they have marvelous studios, major, very, you know, very large uh, uh, sound, uh, you know, stages for radio, very, very big. How would you describe Andrew Allen as a producer or as a director? Oh, he was amazing. He was um, very cool, cool, cool. Just a, a very cool guy and uh, meticulous in his detail. And he, in his casting and so on, he was very uh, astute in that uh, he never read people for parts, ever. No. He'd conduct an interview. You'd have an interview. He'd know of you. He may know of you and so on, and your work and so on with other people. But if he considered using you, he wouldn't call you cold. You'd go in for an interview, and if the interview was successful, you worked that stage series or whatever you did, you worked it constantly. And if you worked for him, there were actors, for example, who, uh, well, my wife, for example, when she went to uh, Toronto, uh, there were a lot of other shows, tons of radio shows. There was school broadcasts and all kinds and children's programs and everything. And people had expressed an interest in using her. And, you know, but, you know, that's fine. They can express an interest, but there, was, there weren't any scripts being forwarded. <laughs> but then Andrew Allen had an interview with her. And the following, I think the following week, she did a stage series starring role. And on Monday, that phone rang. And she never, <laughs> she never stopped working because the Pope blessed her. It was okay to use her now. It was safe. 
And so she got so busy that she did, uh, one time she did nine radio shows in one day. You know, she just handed her the script and she'd go from studio to studio. She had no time to do a read through and you know, she would just go from studio to studio. And so that's what radio was like in those days. And it was Mr. Arngren, I'm sure. And Mr. And it was always Mr. and Mrs. It was, that's the way he talked to you, didn't it? Or was it by first name? No, it was first name. In yeah. Toronto, they say that it was a lot more formal. Maybe it was the West Coast. Was yeah, he wasn't formal here. No, he, he really wasn't. The, uh, the executives, uh, you know, the executive kind of producers and so on, like the Ira Dilworths and so on, were very formal, addressed you very formally. But no, I didn't find him formal. I, he was cool. He, he, he you know, it was a, 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 not a lot of expression <laughs> going on. But, but he was just absolutely brilliant. How was Essa in comparison? How was Essa was a totally different kind of animal. Essa was very emotional. He, you know, cried card tricks. And uh, he too did a, an incredible uh, casting procedure. He would go to the commissary and, you'd be, and that's why the CBC in Toronto, the commissary was the place to be. That's, you just, you got up in the morning <laughs> and if you want to work, you were in the commissary. You just drank all that coffee, you got wired, and you hung out there, and Essa would sort of walk through, and you see Essa, and it was sort of on a lower level, and he'd come through, up on the staircase, and you sort of look over the entire room, and you say, oh, I think Bud Knapp's working next week. Oh, John Draney's gonna be doing that. Oh, I think I'm doing something too. <laughs> because he would sort of scan the room, and that's how he cast it. He would just go to the commissary, and sort of, have an overview of the whole place and say, okay, that's my cast. <laughs> it worked? It worked, sure, oh yeah. Going over and back into the theater um, yes. in the early days, uh, what do you know about Dorothy Somerset and the work she did? <clears throat> Dorothy Somerset was the most unusual uh, movement in the theater because she was before her time. <laughs> I mean, there was, if you think about it, there was a drama <laughs> department at the university, UBC, and uh, there weren't a lot of those around. <laughs> and I think Sidney Risk assisted her, and she conducted the most marvelous uh, theater uh, course uh, for summers, a summer course in the theater. And she brought uh, Robert Gill, who's a very prominent uh, professor of drama at, uh, at McGill. <laughs> and uh, he came up for the summer uh, and I attended and went to, uh, to UBC for the summer and we did a production of uh, Antigone. And he was an incredible director and I did chorus in that. And they double cast uh, Antigone. And, uh, but he, he was brilliant, absolutely fantastic. And for her to have been, you know, have the foresight and the ability to really make that happen because uh, you know, this was, we were in the boonies. <laughs> Just getting out of the boonies. <laughs> so that, that was very impressive. And so I think she had a big influence on the theater as to its quality. Because she always talked about, you know, a standard of, of theater. Like, you just don't do theater for the sake of getting up and doing it. You do it and you do it properly and it should be well directed and the interpretation. And she had a great appreciation for actors and she had a great eye for people who would do it. She, was, she could look, you know, at somebody do a performance and she knew uh, whether they should really do it. And she was very candid. For example, the end of the session with her summer session and, and uh, Robert Gill, she sat down with people with an a very intense one-on-one -on -one kind of interview, and she was more than blunt with people. <laughs> like, keep your day job, like forever. <laughs> Is that what she said? To, no, what did she say to you? Do you remember? Do you remember having that conversation with? Sure, her? I do. Yeah, she said, "Get out of town <laughs> <laughs> and act." Yeah, it's you know, she said it was for me, and uh, a lot of other people too. But uh, there were people that she did say. I don't think you should do this. Who else was in the company? That At that summer thing? Well, there was uh, Peg Dixon, who was uh, Ed McNamara's wife. Uh, she wasn't married to Ed at the time, but Ed, as you know, was a fabulous Canadian actor, and Peg was a marvelous actress, too. And she, she was from Winnipeg, actually. 
but uh, she came out here and she did a lot of radio work and she uh, also did a lot of theater and I'm trying to think of all the other people in that company but I don't really remember yeah, all of them. It's a long time ago. <laughs> you mentioned the Vancouver Theater. Did you have opportunity to work with them also? Sure. Who were the, who were the uh, movers and shakers in terms of the Vancouver Little Theatre. The Movers and Shakers the, uh, the Vancouver Little Theatre were, uh, I guess, uh, Phoebe Smith, uh, Daphne Goldrick, and uh, uh, Christine Chanter, and then there was an, uh, Ivy Ralston and Yvonne Perkins. Now you notice they're all women. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason for that. <laughs> the war caused that. They, they got into a position of enormous power because there weren't any people, any men around to direct. But the exciting thing about that, they were all very different in their style and their technique and skills as directors. But they were all very, very good. Really, really good people. But very different. Quite exciting. And you were saying that the Vancouver Little Theater was the main... Uh, company. Oh yeah, Vancouver. that was it for for a while. That really was it, except for the production, the Shakespearean production that Frank Lambert Smith would do, and he would do those at the at the Strand and the Lyric, and then he would do Salon things at the hotels, and then I went on a tour with him uh, to, uh, I guess, into the interior, Hope and so on, and that's when we went over a cliff. Dorothy Davis was on that tour and everything, and I was in the car. We were returning from uh, Kelowna, I guess it was, and on the Hope Princeton Highway, and we hit some black ice and everything. We went over, <laughs> we went 120 feet over a cliff, like flipped over like nine times. And I thought everybody was dead. Two people jumped out of the top, and uh, I was in the car. And, and the, the, the Frank Nimer Smith, the producer, director, the star, and the designer were unconscious. And I thought, well, they're dead, so that's that. So I stood on their heads <laughs> and climbed out of the car. That's the only way I could get out. I thought, well, <laughs> they won't know anyway. <laughs> because I could smell gas. And I thought, this thing's going to go. And there I am in the bottom of this place with snow. We're right at the water's edge and everything. And I see these people at the top, you know, who, Ray Brown who, from the Beachcombers. And she's yelling from, you know, up above. And, and the uh, passenger up above is there. But the other person in the front seat had jumped and he got smashed into the rocks and very badly injured. But anyway, it all turned out very well, because, well, except the fact is that uh, everyone passing by thought we were dead, so it was reported that we were all killed. It was on the CBC Evening News, and my mother thought I was dead. So when I arrived back, she was in great shock when I appeared at the door. <laughs> but then the CBC did a radio drama all about it, going over the cliff and starring me about you know, going on with the play because we were doing a Shakespearean production for Sydney Risk at the, I think it was As You Like It, at the uh, Vancouver Little Theatre. And my ribs were taped. And then it, it was a lot of fun. You talk about walking over people's faces when you Sure. Go. Oh, sure. <laughs> well, you have to survive. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> So what would you, I mean, where, where did the Vancouver, did they have, they had one venue for the Vancouver? One venue, yeah, the York, it was the York Theatre over near, I guess, Commercial Drive. Can you describe the York Theatre? Kind of well, my memories of it were that it was very compact. I'm sure that it sat like, I would think, I could be terribly wrong about this and somebody will correct me, but it, in the area of like four, 450 or something like that. It was an intimate kind of theatre, wonderful, wonderful sight lines. And a nice stage, and you know, a, a good, a very good plant. I mean, it was really amazing for a little theater. It was a, it was a great venue. And they always had beautiful sets. I mean, the, the quality, the standard of the productions was really amazing when you thought that it really was an amateur theater. A lot, a lot of good people. So they had devoted people who were the tech crew, like the person who built the sets and so on. I think he built those sets for 30 years, I don't know. And there were people who did lights and sound, and they were there just forever, just forever. And also, I guess, uh, getting, getting into the 50s, well, actually, I guess Theater of the Stars was also happening, but that would be summer. Oh, just summer, yeah. And how did that compare in terms of quality at that time? Was it cool? Oh, yes, had a very high standard of quality, yeah. Very, very good. Yeah, always, yeah. I was amazed at the, uh, at the standard of, of uh, 
the quality. As a matter of fact, when I left Vancouver to go to Toronto and then to New York and so on, I really came to realize how high the standard had been because I was quite prepared that, you know, what I was going to see. I'd been to New York before and seen theater when I had the Totem Theater, seen a lot of Broadway shows. And yeah, some were okay, some weren't. But generally speaking, when I started to see theater elsewhere, uh, the quality was not that consistent as it was in Vancouver. And who was responsible, you think, for that consistency of quality at the theater in the stars in those days? Who was really responsible for all that? Well, I think all those women were <laughs> that I mentioned. They really were. So they were also and involved. And Sydney Risk. They were also involved in Tuts. The women you men mentioned were with Vancouver Theatre, but they also... They were Vancouver Theatre. No, they, they didn't get involved with Theatre on the Stars. That really was the territory of uh, Jimmy Johnston, uh, Bill Buckingham. Dorothy Davies did direct some things. Other, other people did direct. I, I don't know all the and I know that Peter did and so on. But that really... Uh, Evie Young and all those people were responsible for that, but uh, Bill uh, and Jimmy Johnston were really the driving forces in maintaining the quality of that. And they had uh, uh, Gail McCance, who was Larry McCance's brother, was responsible for all the scenery, and that incredible scenery. And then they had a fabulous designer made named Stuart McKay, and uh, the costumes were like spectacular. So when they invited, they started to bring in stars, or you know, semi-stars for the leads, and they brought in Ada Broadbent, an American choreographer, and so on. Those people only came because they heard of the standard, and uh, they were really very, very impressed. I'm going to be speaking with Jimmy Johnson. I wonder if you could describe him. I mean, how would you describe him as a, as a director? Oh, he was a marvelous director. Very, he was very intense and uh, very detailed and very good, I think. Uh, I never worked with him because uh, uh, any time that he directed, uh, I wasn't involved, and then he did a lot of those musicals. But he was very detailed in his uh, direction also, uh, at a very high standard of quality. I mean, it just had to be good. I mean, very painstaking with actors to you know, get the best from them and make it really happen. But his productions were very, very good. And also at that time, I guess, there was also, at least in, in the early 50s, um, Everyman Theatre with Sydney Risk. Yeah. Where so did that position itself when you look at it, the other things? In quality? Like, in quality, I guess, yeah. Oh, I think, yeah, very, a very high standard uh, of quality. They were doing different kinds of theatre. The, the Vancouver Theatre did... Uh, it wasn't, uh, I don't mean that they were pop boys, I don't mean that they were, they were established like, they would, you know, they would do Lillian Hellman plays, uh, they would do uh, uh, Noel Coward, they would do that extremely well because they had wonderful people around to do that and so on. But uh, Everyman Theatre, we were doing Chekhov and Ibsen and Andrea Bay's Noah, which went to the drama festival and everything in Calgary. And... Um, that kind of thing. It was different. You were in that company of Noah? That was, was yes. Was Joy Cockhill was in that, wasn't she? No. Oh, she no, she was not in that particular production. And then every man did uh, Shaw, like I did uh, production of Arms and the Man with Lillian Carlson. And uh, they were doing really, I guess, uh, more classic uh, kind of theater, really than uh, the other theatre people were really doing. You know, ex for example, like with Totem and so on, we did very popular kind of fair, with the exception, we, we, you know, we did uh, Sartre and things like that, and, and Shaw, and, and, you know, different things. But a lot of our things were popular theatre because you had to augment it with, you know, Noel Coward, <laughs> and then we put in the Tennessee Williams and things like that, because otherwise you wouldn't have had an audience. You mentioned the Dominion Drama Festival. What do you, what, what, looking back, what, how important do you think the Dominion Drama Festival was in terms of establishing um, and recognizing theatre in Canada? Oh, I think it was very important. Yeah, I think it served a, a great need at that particular time. It made people across the country really aware mm -hmm. that there was a theatre. A theatre did exist in Canada. And uh, people, for example, uh, from Quebec, like French-speaking, they would bring French plays Toronto would bring, you know, an English-speaking play, but maybe an original. Or I think, as a matter of fact, uh, they did Clifford Odette's uh, 
Oh, I can't remember what it was. So. Anyway, a marvelous Clifford the Death's kind of thing. But very hard, you know, biting kind of production and everything. And uh, I remember that vividly as if it were yesterday. It was so well done. But the French theater was great. I mean, if you didn't speak the language, it wouldn't make any difference. But then they were excited by seeing the theater from the West Coast. I, yeah, I think it was very important. It must have been an exciting time to be part of that, be there and, 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 oh, yeah. and share with, with the others. Oh, yeah, it was. Because, for example, just the regional aspect of it was exciting because there'd be, I don't know, I guess five local production each center would be produced and they would really strive for really you know, quality stuff because they bring out an uh, adjudicator from England, you know, a prominent, you know, director, actor, like I think they had Saint Denis come out to Calgary as, as the adjudicator and that, you know, that's, that's a pretty big guy at that time. And uh, was well, a big guy, big guy today in the history of theater, and so people really did strive to do wonderful things. And I think that often the adjudicators, the quality of the work in all the centers, not just Vancouver, I think it was so good. I think the adjudicators had a very difficult time in deciding uh, what to choose, and I felt that sometimes uh, they didn't always make the right choice. And I say I think that sometimes. It was sort of political, like they would choose a play. Well, for example, Andrea Bay's Noah. We won the, the festival here in Vancouver and it was taken to Calgary for the final festival and everything. And it competed with, you know, marvelous productions like of Little Foxes and so on. And uh, I think Little Foxes really was a much better production. The acting was superb. But I think that the adjudicator felt that Andrea Bay's thing was reaching for something else, and it was not the run of the mill. It wasn't a pat Broadway production. It was, it was experimental theater at its at its best, really, and I think it was chosen for that. To of course be doomed because when it went to Calgary, the adjudicator was Saint Denis who who wrote it. <laughs> and he, he thought it was terrible. Oh yes, we thought. Well, what was wrong with it? It was so Canadian. It was so uptight, Anglo-Saxon kind of stuff for a French person. He was appalled. It was so polite. <laughs> because it should be rude and vulgar and, and, and a crudity about it and a sexuality about it. And sexuality, oh <laughs> my God. I mean, nobody said such sexuality, let alone <laughs> thought about working it into a production. So, uh, no, he didn't like it. <laughs> Did you, did you know about the Campagna? The, the I knew about it and everything, but I hadn't, at that point, when we were at the Dominion Drum Festival, I was just really exciting. Yeah. Well, even, for example, uh, they brought a children's play here to the, to the, oh, the Kulch, I guess it was. And uh, it was just absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. I, I saw it last year. And it knocked you right on your ass. It was so good. Just take your breath away. People were so stunned that they didn't know, uh, they couldn't applaud. They just sat there, tears streaming down their faces. And it was a children's play. Now that's doing it. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this is true or not, but in 1951, I, in, according to the notes, uh, blame it on Peter Manor, I was wrong, you, you actually turned down jobs at the Theatre of the Stars, you and Stewart, I guess, as property men. Why would you do that? And you, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you were, and I don't, okay, well, you did that. And then I guess, where did the gold dust tunes come from? Where did that, or is that? Well, the prop thing is very funny because I don't actually remember that. Okay. <laughs> I don't remember. We could very well have been, but it would never have entered my mind because, no, I was a terrible, I wasn't terrible, but uh, I always avoided uh, the techie stuff. You know, the painting of the scenery and everything that I was supposed to do. I never painted any of that scenery, did any of that stuff. It was just, I was too busy doing other things. That was just too time consuming. I just thought there were all kinds of people who could do that and would never go on to do what I was doing. And it was an utter waste of my time. <laughs> I knew all about it. I know how to do it. <laughs> I took courses and everything, but I didn't bother with it. So uh, it could well have been offered. And yes, I would have turned it down. <laughs> and the Gold Dust Twins, what is that? Uh, where did that I think the Gold Dust Twins was just that uh, we just were everywhere. Like we did press for a lot of people. We did press, as a matter of fact, for, uh, for uh, Peter Mannering when he did the Beggar's Opera. And then he wasn't going to pay us. And we had a, 
hot, a rather intense meeting at the Hotel Vancouver. And I said, bugger your beggar's opera because there won't be an inch more space if you don't pay up. <laughs> and I think he wanted costumes or something. And I said, no, you got to pay it. Anyway, uh, and we did press for the everyman and, and a lot of different people. But, you know, wouldn't you rather do press than uh, props? I just, you know. <laughs> How did you meet Stuart Baker? I met him at a casting at the Vancouver Theatre. I think that's where everybody met. I'm convinced that that's where I, I met my wife Norma. We don't know when we met, but I'm sure it was at a casting session. And uh, was it sort of a connection right at the beginning, or was it just how did that, how did it evolve? You went from that to... Uh... Well, um, I met him at that, and then I think Frank Lambert Smith was putting together a production, and I can't even remember what the production was, whether it was David Copperfield or whatever it was. And uh, I had read for it, and he said he wanted to use me. And when we met at this particular casting for the Bank of the Theatre, I, I think it was a very uh, English play, like, uh, you know, had to just really have English people, and Stuart was from England and so on. So, you know, he was automatically going to do it, and Phoebe Smith was directing it. And we happened to, you know, I was reading for it, but it was, you know, there was no point in it. But uh, when he and I got talking, I told him it's great, he should do it. He said he was going to do the Frank Lambert Smith play, and I said I was going to, and then that's how we really got working together. And after that, we had a lot of ideas about, uh, you know, what was happening in town. And we just thought a lot of the actors weren't really being used, and there wasn't any reason why there really couldn't be a theater company. So we talked to all the actors first, and, and you know, because we were working with them on kind of a, you know, day-to-day -day basis and so on, and asked them, you know, what they thought of it. And of course, this was ludicrous. Why would we even think about asking me to have to ask them? Just tell them there's going to be a theater and you might get paid. <laughs> They're going to be there. So it was very naive of us to, to consult. We thought it was correct because we felt, oh, these are the gods of the, the industry. We were just kids, you know. I was like 20 years old, so we should ask permission to see if they really wanted to do it. And uh, we outlined what we had in in mind and everything, we said that uh, we'd try to raise some money, but we said that uh, we couldn't guarantee the salaries and so on to be on a kind of a unit basis, that all expenses would have to be paid first, and then the people who did the most shows on a unit basis would naturally get paid the most money out, out of the kitty, which turned out to be a very funny situation because I think we were into the, probably the second week of production on, at Ambleside Park in the Outdoor Theater, and somebody, some of the cast said that they wanted to have a meeting because they would like to take over the, the company because they felt they weren't being paid and they thought that, you know, that this could be done a lot better than it was being done because of the, where is the money? Ed McNamara actually was a ringleader of that and his, and his wife Peg, <laughs> who are very good friends. <laughs> and Stuart got into a total panic and said, what are we going to do? And I said, it's very simple. We'll give it to them. <laughs> I said, won't it be marvelous to be rid of all those liabilities? Because I said, in taking it over, they get all the liabilities and we don't have any. And I said, they're going to ask us. They did hint that they might want us to run it and they would pay us. So I said to the steward, I said, can you imagine? We're not going to have any liabilities and they're going to pay us. <laughs> so we had this little meeting and of course what happened was, was I knew what was going to happen was when we presented this to them. They, did, they were welcome to have it, no problem at all. And then here were the little bills and all the liabilities. It just died right there <laughs> and it was all over. <laughs> Actors don't like bills. And where did the name Totem come from? Was that just... Well, it just came out, uh, it was really a calculated kind of thing to get the support of the Tours Bureau and the, you know, the local I suppose, Board of Trade, Chamber of Commerce, what have you, that sort of idea. And it worked. I mean, when I say it worked, uh, you know, certain local dignitaries and so on involved themselves because uh, they felt it was a good thing for the community and they could cash in on it too, so it worked out fine. Now, you said there was a, a niche for this, for maybe paying actors. I mean, was not every man paying, or was, did you feel they weren't giving this, or, or Theater of the Stars they were paying? Um, oh, so why, it, why, where did you see the need for another company? Well, because Theatre and Stars was doing musicals, 
And uh, as I mentioned before, the everyman was doing Ibsen, Chekhov, Shaw, and those kind of things. They weren't doing popular theater. And their attendance really was kind of bad. And they had no promotion. Their, their promotion was like zilch. It just wasn't, I mean, people didn't know when it was happening. And they were also doing a repertory kind of thing. And the, the local people weren't ready for like, you know, to look up their thing now, you know, because people are accustomed to it. But you tell people of that period, you know, well, Tuesday night is Arms and the Man, and, uh, and uh, Wednesday through Friday is Noah, and then on Sunday afternoon is Noel Coward. Well, the people couldn't figure out. It's terrible to say there was so little interest really in the community. There was a hardcore, a handful of people who were interested in the theater. The rest of the people couldn't deal with that kind of a schedule. And then their venues where they played were really, really unattractive. I mean, they were storefronts and, they, and it really wasn't comfortable. It wasn't, there was no excitement about it or anything. And, uh, and as I say, no promotion until Stuart and I became involved. <laughs> You, uh, two of your challenges, I guess, was finding a location and money, and I guess money, some of the money came from a, a farmer, is that true? Right. How did that? Uh... Well, that was, uh, he, he'd been a friend of my family's uh, on the prairies in Saskatchewan and so on, and he'd done very well and had come to Vancouver. He was retired. He, he was probably in his you know, fifth, early 50s, 52 or so on, and uh, he had a lot of money. For, you know, for that time, it wouldn't be a lot of money today. And uh, I knew he was interested in what I was doing, and so I asked him, you know, it wasn't an investment, it was a loan. Because at that time, if you asked anybody to invest in the theater, first of all, it would have been ludicrous. I mean, it was either a gift, you'd have to say, hey, you're never going to see this buddy, or I'll, I'll guarantee you that I'll pay this back. And you really meant it, you know, you, you signed the little old note and everything, but you couldn't possibly suggest to anyone that this was a business venture. Like, I mean, what, what projections are you going to give them? There's this little park. <laughs> on the West Shore, and we're going to have, you know, 500 seats, and gee, we know you'll make money. <laughs> yes, sure you will. So we didn't do that, but he loaned us, I guess, a couple thousand dollars, and then we went to uh, suppliers, so it was, you know, uh, something to build the, uh, the fence and the stage and so on, and it worked out. Everybody got paid, and some of the actors made a few bucks. They didn't make a lot. Lillian Carlson did pretty well, though. <laughs> She did a lot of shows, and Norma did very well. <laughs> Those girls were shrewd; <laughs> they hung with it. <laughs> but uh, and uh, you shared the, you were sharing, I guess, that Ambleside Park with baseball team. Oh, sure. And did that cause problems at some point? You were there no, were, there not, were games going on while you were performing. Or? Oh yeah, yeah, it wasn't too big a problem. No. No pop flies on the stage. Or no, no, no. A few cheers and so on in the middle of private lives and so on. But I mean, <laughs> I mean Sam loved it. I mean, thought it was for him. <laughs> what was the what was the story behind the toilet facilities? I understand they were pretty primitive. Oh yes, they were just the the, the toilet facilities that were provided by the park. You know that was it. Oh no, and the dressing rooms were just uh, you know little areas you know backstage. I mean that was it. Oh yeah, it was primitive. But everyone was happy with it because it was just new and fresh and they didn't really... Well, people just didn't, it didn't occur to them. Well, of course it occurred to them that the toilets and the wash facility, you know, they were really, it was primitive. But it was the adventure of the whole thing. The whole fact that it was actually happening at all just amazed everybody. It amazed the... Well, there was a lot of, always a lot of talk, I mean, about theater. I mean, that has always gone on and still goes on. About, Oh, there's going to be this company and so on, but there was more than I suppose than, than there is now, and uh, so the whole idea that it actually took place, the, oh, they, sure, the, the, they were very nice. They said, "Oh yes, yeah, sure, they're going to do this theater. Yeah, sure, I bet." And so when we really did it, and we said, oh, "Hear the scripts and so on," you know, they were excited, just like the local media was too. Like there can't be a theater in Ambleside Park. What are they talking about? And so it really took place. And your first production was Light Up the Sky? Light Up the Sky, yeah. Do you remember the rehearsal, you know, so your first rehearsal process? Do you remember, the, you talk a little bit about that maybe in the company of players that you brought together for this first... Uh... Well, the, it, it included just a, everybody from, you know, 
you know, Doris Buckingham, which she, you know, she was, you know, light of the sky, and uh, all the all the people really were, you know, CBC people except for, you know, some other supporting roles and so on. But uh, now the rehearsal process it was fast because you had to get it on, which was uh, it was pre-television. I mean, there was no television at that point, and little did these people know that they were getting, you know, the greatest kind of training that you could possibly imagine by doing a play a week. I mean, that's, you know, that's a lot of stuff to learn and to create a character and not to bump into the furniture. It's not easy to do. Well, in fact, you were rehearsing one play in the morning, one in the afternoon and performing in the evening. That's right. That's absolutely true. So it was very, very hectic. Who directed uh, Light Up Your Sky? Light Up Your Sky? I think Phoebe Smith directed that. And what are your memories, if any, of opening night, your big opening night? Of Oh, it was exciting. We had so much fun. I mean, we were so silly. I mean, the whole thing was amazing to us, too. I mean, it really was. And we, you know, you know no fear. It's just, it's so, it's so magical for actors and creative people that it is happening, that there's no fear about any of it. I mean, you, you just do it. And uh, I don't know what, in your whole mind, like, they, there are going to be people, and there were people. People actually came to see it and, and, and enjoyed it. And uh, one time we were only, like, as far as rain, we had one rainy night and we refused to <laughs> return any of it because we couldn't afford it. So we tore down the walls and we uh, took the seats away. Every, no one left and the people drove into the, in front of the stage in their cars. And it was the first drive-in legit theater and it made <laughs> billboard and cash box in the States and everything. And, People at the Theatre on Stars were furious about us getting national press of <laughs> this drive-in kind of situation. And it was ludicrous if you think about it because they couldn't have heard anything. So it must have been like mime. But they all stayed and had a, <laughs> had a great time. That's great. Um... Oh, and during that, and that summer too, we did Born Yesterday with Lillian Carlson. And we created, we had a, there was a, the Pacific National Exhibition did much bigger parades than, the, than they did now, and it went all through downtown and everything. And we created a, a very elaborate float with a stork, a paper mache stork, I don't know, 15 feet high or something, with a diaper and everything, with Lillian Carlson. I mean, totally sexist today, <laughs> but then sexism <laughs> was in. And there she was in this bathing suit, <laughs> high heels, and a fur coat in this diaper, riding down Granville Street. Well, we were sold out. We held it, held it over for an extra week. And I guess that was a bit, of, I don't know, maybe it wasn't in, in today, hindsight, it would be a gutsy move because you were already in the hole and yet you, you decided to go ahead and do this anyway. I mean, That's right. The only uh, thing that made us do the winter location was that we had enough money that all the creditors, like the, the people with the building material, the electrical work, and the farmer all got their money back at the end of the summer. It's also unheard of. I don't know if this is a true story, but this is where Doris Buckingham and Bruno Jerusi. I don't know, it, perhaps it was light up the sky when Bruno was uh, um, blowing smoke into the casket or something that Doris was in. Oh, yes, that was at, yeah, that was at the Arena Theatre on Dunsbury, yes, that's true. Could you tell me that story? Or? Well, just that she wasn't amused. <laughs> Doris was, you know, was the grand dame of the theatre, and that was not amusing to her. <laughs> She was a very beautiful woman, and that was unsettling to her, because she might not look lovely when she came out of that little, little box. <laughs> How did she react to Bruno doing that? I mean, that was just totally impromptu. Oh, I don't think she was too pleased about it for a while. She recovered, but, but she, she didn't like it. <laughs> what are your first impressions of Bruno? I mean, when he came to become part of the company, he wasn't a big name at that point. He was one of the, just a smaller member of the cast. At the beginning? Well, um, my first impressions of Bruno were that he was very exciting. You know, it would be like a, a, a Brando, you know, kind of, kind of quality and an unpolished, exciting kind of thing. I really liked that because there were a lot of people, I'd seen a lot of people locally, you know, not everybody, but there was a lot of uh, very, uh, I don't know, stock kind of acting going on and a tendency to that very uh, Anglo-Saxon, uptight approach to acting. And he was raw, very, very raw. And for us, when we 
were doing, you know, things like Little Foxes and so on, and uh, Tennessee Williams, like Glass Menagerie, and uh, locally, you couldn't have cast, it, it, it couldn't have happened. We couldn't have done Streetcar without Bruno, it wouldn't have happened. There was no actor in, in that category that had the, uh, the talent and the raw talent and the sensuality that Stanley Kowalski should have. There just wasn't anybody. They were good actors. Like Ed McNamara was a wonderful actor. He, Ed McNamara had also that wonderful, untrained, raw thing that made him such a good actor. But he would have been miscast as Stanley wouldn't have worked. So we were, we were really fortunate that Bruno was around. Speaking of Streetcar, you had, do you remember any of the, uh, like, well, Ian, Ian Doby directed that. Ian Doby directed Dobby that, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, he was a marvelous lighting designer. He worked for uh, Ufa, the uh, German filmmakers. So he was very big on that Marlon Dietrich backlighting and everything for films. And of course, that's absolutely what you want in arena staging because we had a thrust stage. It was an audience on three sides. And then we did sets, psych, a psych kind of at the back. And we'd always do kind of elaborate, you know, uh, I guess mood pieces in the back and so like scrims and like for Streetcar it was a scrim with a sp spiral staircase in New Orleans kind of thing. But all his backlighting and thing uh, just worked for Arena, it was just marvelous. So it was just a series of pools of light and, and a lot of light cues just made it. You didn't have scenery. So we made it with intimacy and detail in uh, uh, the props and the lighting. Like when we did, uh, I directed a production of, uh, uh, oh, gosh, I can't remember. Voice of the Turtle, yes, Voice of the Turtle. And I don't know if you know that play, but it's a play that's set during the war, and it's at this girl's apartment, and she takes this, she meets this soldier, and she brings him back to her place, and he spends the night and everything. Well, we had running water, full kitchen set and everything, breakaway thing hot cold water and we cooked an entire breakfast with the bacon, the eggs, it all happened right on the stage and they ate it. That's the kind of th thing we would do to make up for the fact that you didn't have those big sets and, and uh, so we went into great, great detail. Uh, talk about Derek Mann's contribution to... The Derek Mann, enormous because he was, um, uh, he really designed, he was responsible uh, for our stage. It was really, uh, we, we knew what we wanted, yes, but it was really his design and the, and the proportions that he gave it that made it work so successfully. Yeah, he designed that. It was a first in Canada, wasn't it? Yes, it was, yeah. Now, Yvonne Firkins had a, had a an arena stage theater. She, you know, that was the beginning of the arts club, and so on. She had that. And yes, she originated that. We did not originate it, but we just took it further in in a larger space and and it was uh, because it was three-sided and also by using the the psych with the sets and so on more more elaborate that's all could you talk about the high-tech uh, air conditioning system you had well yeah <laughs> well i can't imagine i just it kills me when i think we thought that we were having warm summers now that i'm back that just kills me. There are no warm summers <laughs> in Vancouver. But when I lived here, we, th we thought it was warm. And uh, we thought for tourists and so on. And then all the movie theaters were all running these marvelous ads and everything. And they ran little, little icicles around the, the, the marvelous copy and everything that was air conditioned, air cooled, and all that kind of thing. So we'd noticed that up in our attic, we had a ventilation system, but it was like a huge fan blue air from outside. He just brought it in, that's all it did. So Stuart and I devised this plan. We thought, well, gosh, if we put a lot of ice in front of that fan, that'll do it, that'll be really great. So we tested it, and there was a tray that these blocks of ice, and the guy would come every day, you know, in the afternoon and bring these blocks of ice and put them up there. And it really did work, and so we ran those ads, and business jumped, it really did. And people talked about how nice and cool it was. And there's this, <laughs> this one evening, <laughs> we see water trickling down the stairway and it's coming into the auditorium and we discovered that the you know, thing is leaking severely. Have they do it leaking? Well, we resolved that with a, hey, we've got this beat now, now we've got the trays all working fine. And then one day the ice man's delivering these blocks of ice and they slip from his tongs 
<laughs> and they crashed through the ceiling into a rehearsal studio where a young woman was getting her first opera lesson. She wanted to be an opera singer. She was getting <laughs> her first <laughs> lesson and the ice crashed through the ceiling into the grand piano and just sat there at a beautiful angle. It was very artistic. <laughs> Clouds of dust <laughs> came from up under the door <laughs> and I think it was Glinda Jones was the coach. <laughs> Great screams, nothing <laughs> from this poor girl. But then the door was flung open. <laughs> this girl ran down the hall, never to be seen again, ever. And then the worst part of it all was the piano was on loan from Theatre Under the Stars. <laughs> they were not amused. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a great sight. But that didn't stop us. We put, kept that ice going up there. Um, you also, another, another uh, there were the Stigmans, I guess. They were the Stigmans. Stigmans, Stigmans, yes. They were the ones that were responsible for the look of your sets? Yes, yeah. Can we talk a little bit about what their contribution well, it was a strange situation because, uh, as you know, we had no money. So uh, the whole idea that you know someone would approach us and say, "We'd like to design your sets," we say, "Well, what sets? And uh, <laughs> who's going to pay you? I mean, is somebody else going to do this?" But anyway, the Arts Council was very young at that time, and they were—they had no funds or anything. They were just sort of a clearinghouse to, uh, I suppose, it was to network different groups and so on. And, and if they could do something, it would be fine. But there were no grants or anything. Going to the Arts Council didn't mean you were going to get any money. But they called us and they said they had this marvelous couple who were here, and they'd come from Europe and so on, and that they had no money. They had no place to live. They had no food or anything. But they're great artists, and they thought perhaps that they might be able to work with us and design sets. And we said, you know, we want to be straight with the people at the concert. We said, well, that's a great idea. We're happy to meet with them, and we'll have lunch or something. And uh, it couldn't hurt to talk, but we, we're not going to have any money. So they came over and everything, they're charming people. And uh, we told them what the situation was. We said, well, there's some food or something, and some wine would be great. And so that was it. They just they went to work on the next show. And they were with us, you know, through the whole thing. And they came to Victoria. They did the whole bit. They were absolutely incredible. They were so imaginative. And he went on to be a very important artist in the United States. Mm. And she as well. She is a portrait artist and he is a muralist. Did some incredible murals throughout the States. Do you remember any uh, particular sets that they did that stand out in memory? That any other, some one production that was more than another? Not really. They were just, they were, they were just, all of them were really marvelous. And then it was interesting, the transition, what was really fascinating was um, their transition from the arena stage, because they were just doing this, creating this incredible ambience with this thing at the back. But when we went to Victoria, to the, what's now the McPherson Theatre, uh, and there they were doing these full sets that were incredible there too. And I was apprehensive about that because I thought, this is a different, this is a very different kind of thing because of the lighting. The lighting is entirely different and what you, you know, the perspective that you're creating. So, no, it was wonderful. We opened with Gigi and it was a magnificent set. Yeah, you've done Gigi over here with yes. a totally different look. I guess. Oh, yes, yeah, that was in the arena, but it was great. You walk like a pregnant duck, you're nothing but a bunch of giggly bitches. Who's that? Ian Dobby. He was the rudest, crudest, most marvelous person <laughs> you could ever imagine. He would, his, he would always open with you know, some crude or rude remark because his whole idea was to shock people. And of course he was wasting his time with us because we couldn't care less. He, it had worked on other people and so on, but we simply didn't care. So we would say things back to him because we'd just shake up. And he, you know, there were times when he would say to me, he said, Thor is nothing sacred with you. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> but, but he would do that to everybody. But it was, he was a good director. He's a wonderful director. But a lot of people were terrified of him and he, he made them, you know, grown people would cry, including men. <laughs> he was mean. 
Uh, one of the actors who uh, there's some funny stories about is John John Emerson. Oh, John Emerson! Yeah, oh, John Emerson was marvelous. He he did. Uh, I did a production of Rope with him, and he was wonderful. Now, but my favorite thing was Man Who Came to Dinner, because he was a personality unto himself. He he really was Sheridan Whiteside, and he knew that. You know, he didn't have to play that part. I'll just walk on stage and say the dialogue. Now, it would have been marvelous if he had remembered the dialogue he was supposed to say. But he had an even worse habit than not remembering it. He would remember what he had forgotten several scenes later. And then he would say, stop, I remember what I wanted to say. And we'd go back. <laughs> but he just loved all those words, and he wanted to be sure that none of them were wasted. I'm in this, I'm going to say these. So I forgot them way back. We're going to do them anyway. So he was wonderful. Speaking of dinner, he actually went up for dinner during a production, didn't he? Yes, he did. <laughs> he also had a billing mania. He always wanted the biggest billing you could possibly imagine. And during our last season in Vancouver, we were at the George Auditorium, which sat like, I don't know, 2,000 people in an arena, if you can imagine that. Absolutely ridiculous. And uh, that marquee was very small, always had been a small marquee. And he was used to, you know, getting, you know, big billing and everything. Well, he had it in the ads and the whole thing, but he wants something, he, you know, said it isn't big enough, you know, in front of the theater and so on. So Stuart and I said, well, let's get him good this time. Because we, it, it couldn't get bigger. That's all that was available. So we went out and we got like a nine foot tall banner it covered the side of the Georgia Auditorium, cost us several hundred dollars, but we didn't care. <laughs> and it said, starring John Emerson. And it was so large, it was embarrassing to him. <laughs> and so we said, you know, you like that billing? <laughs> That's the production we had the elephant in. And that was fun. <laughs>